This is the Sergio Rodriguez Show. Welcome, everybody, to the Sergio Rodriguez Show, a show unlike any other. Joining me right now, Mets beat writer for the record in the USA Today Network, Justin Toscano. Justin, how are you, my friend? Doing well, Sergio. Thanks for having me on. No, man, I appreciate you taking time out on this lovely Martin Luther King Day. I have the Knicks in the background. It's one always one of my favorite things uh, on Martin Luther King Day is to watch the Knicks play. And uh, I'm probably one of like six Knicks fans left in the world. So, <laughs> so I get a chance to watch and, 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 and it's probably like the only marquee game time slot that we that we get these days, you know? Right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's rough territory around there at, at MSG for for a long time now. We'll see if they can get it turned around. But, man, it just feels like the Nets have been obviously got that star power, but it, it just always feels like it'll still kind of be a Knicks town, you know? It is. If the Knicks are good, nothing else matters in this town. I try to tell my son that, who my both my boys, one is 13, one's 16, I try to tell him that if the Knicks are good, no other sport, no other team here matters, and they think I'm crazy. But hopefully, one day they'll get to live it. But <laughs> one day, one yeah. day, one day, one day. Let's uh, let's get to the Mets because that's part of the reason why I wanted to have you on. You know, the Mets last week make the move for Lindor, and they also bring Carrasco over. It was a trade that was a no-brainer in terms of having to make, right? Especially with what you were giving up. Um, similar to the Yankees making that Stanton trade, right? You know, you you were taking on a lot of money, but when you're only giving up Starling Castro, you had to do it. But first of all, let's examine the trade, and then I want to give you a scenario of where I think, now, again, like I said, I think the trade needed to be made, but I, but I do have something, I, I do have something that could be an issue with the trade for the Mets. But speak to me about the trade the way it was made. Yeah. So, I mean, I think the prism that I look at it through is, look, you've got new ownership, new front office, you know, new GM. You're looking to make considerable strides to this team, and you've got the leeway, the financial resources to do so in a year where 26 out of 30 teams haven't done much this offseason, right? And so you get this trade you know you've got a partner in Cleveland that has only you know has got Francisco Lindor and it's very clear that those contract extensions and you know negotiations had, had stopped with Cleveland it's very clear that they weren't going to be able to pay him so the leverage starts right there and I think the prism I look at it through is look you get this star player that you know obviously nothing's guaranteed but I think if you're the Mets you don't make that trade unless you have a considerable amount of optimism that you can extend Francisco Lindor and make him um, sort of somewhat of a, a franchise centerpiece and, and so that you know you, you have the money and you have the means to do that. Um, but where they lucked out is that because you're only getting, you're giving up more years of control for fewer years of control, you know, one year of control for Lindor, two, you know, plus an option for Carrasco, you only give up, Look, I like Andres Jimenez. I, I think he's going to be a very good player. Ahmed Rosario could even still take a jump. He's still only 24 years old. But you're giving up those two shortstops for a superstar. That's a no-brainer. And they didn't even give up, you know, they gave up the ninth and 10th ranked prospects um, in their system, according to MLB Pipeline. So to me, to not have to give up any of their, really of their position player core, the young guys that you would want around here for five plus years, or any of those top prospects, you know, and then the group that they want to stay away from is a big victory. Okay, I'm going to set up a scenario for you. All right, shoot. Okay, so Lindor comes to New York as a guy who, and I'll be honest with you, when I watch him with my eyes, I see a really good player. When I watch him statistically, he doesn't scream two hundred and fifty million dollars because, but but that's just the way that I look at players. I'm a big, I'm big on playing on paying players who are run producers, not just scoring them, but also driving them in. Now let's stop right there for a sec. If Lindor comes here and gives you 
a a good year. 27 home runs, 95 runs scored, 80 RBI, bats 285, 335 on base percentage. Uh, so I basically gave you his per 162. Right. You give that guy $250 million? I do, because I think... Um, I mean, I think you've got to look at the type of person you're getting to, okay. um, the type of excitement he brings. I mean, you know, nicknamed the smile for a reason, the type of excitement he brings every one of his teammates in Cleveland just raved about not only the way he played, but the way he led. And I look at it from this way too, is that a lot of people, and this was a good point, were maybe against the Lindor trade at first, or not even against it, but questioned it. Um, earlier in the offseason because you think, well, if you look at next offseason, you've got Trevor Story potentially on the market. And, that's where I, and, and I don't mean to cut you off, but that's where I was going to go. Go ahead. Yeah, and so I look at those guys, but man, in a more potentially more normal market next year, aren't you going to have to pay a lot of those guys somewhat – similar figures maybe not 250 million but the AAV is gonna gonna get up on on some of those guys so I give him the 250 million if that's what it takes because that allows me to get somebody who is a superstar and then allows me because because you're jump starting the franchise now right and that allows me next year in free agency to do something else with with other positions as needed now we're assuming that the Mets are going to be... I know everybody's under this impression that Cohen is just going to spend money. I don't believe that anybody gets into a business. I don't care how much money you have. Nobody brings money from another business to spend in this business. At the end of the day, these guys want to make money. So I don't think that he's just going to be handing out, you know, money like crazy just because he's a Met fan or he's got it from other avenues. I still feel that the Mets, that would be the worst case scenario for the Mets. I think they need a big time year from Lindor to justify that. Um, Because I believe that those shortstops that are going to be out there next year, I believe Seager's one of them too. And I think, uh, uh, the, the, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the kid from Anaheim too, uh, Andrelton, uh, Simmons, right? Simmons. Yep. Those guys, you could, you're going to be able to get them at essentially 50 cents on the dollar based on what you're going to have to pay Lindor, particularly a guy like Story. But so I think that the Mets really need at least this year a big time year from Lindor. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, you could you could make that case, especially to, to justify it. I know Steve Cohen has said, you know, they're not going to spend like drunken sailors. But I do think, I mean, if you've got a superstar level player that is the other thing is that you see these free agent contracts getting dished out big, you know, long years, you know, it's guys, you know, into their late, you know, 30s. But he's only 27. Correct. And so I think that's another another big thing to remember here. And I think the thinking is, is that with like when I looked at the offseason months ago. I thought the same exact thing you did. You know, I'm like, you know, Lindor is a, a great player. You know, he's a super one of the game's premier players, you know, in fact. But do they make that now when there are going to be shortstops available on the market next year? And that's why I thought initially, I was like, you know, unless it's a great deal, I, I just don't see him doing that, especially because they want to spend more in free agency and they're committed to doing so. But they've got a great deal. And the other thing that I think, might be lost in all this is that they're getting a superstar shortstop and in turn fixing the problem they were going to have, right? Because last year, Andres Jimenez overtook a med Rosario in that shortened season, you know, where Luis Rojas was playing the hot hand, you know, for good reason, because it's a short season, do or die pretty much every day. Um, and so they, but they were going to have to face that problem again this year. So they, they had to answer that question of, who is, you know, the shortstop of the future? Is it best for a contending team to really platoon, um, to use a platoon at, at kind of a, a premium position? I don't know. You know, you answer that amongst yourselves. But it's like, 
I, and I think that, so I think this also solved that issue, which is why, you know, I mean, with Rosario, not really, I mean, this was a guy who was baseball's top prospect at one point before coming you up. You know, it's Bill funny you a, say a that superstar. because, it's funny you say that because I had Kenny Davidoff on a month ago, like, I, and, and we argued about this. I told him this guy was supposed to be, he was telling me that Rosario was not the top guy, and I found him two publications which listed him as the number one guy. I mean, this this was the guy. He was supposed to be, you know, a problem solver for the Mets for 10 years there. Yeah, no, you, you're completely correct. Is I, I basically, I mean, I'll, I'll use Baseball America sometimes and other play like fan graphs, but for a lot of these prospect things, I tend to go to MLB Pipeline just because they've got a lot of great people over there. The league, you know, they've seen a lot of these great players, got a lot of great intel on them. He was he was their number one prospect before coming up uh, in baseball as a whole, not just for the Mets in baseball as a whole. So that's a guy who is billed as a superstar, right? And then it hasn't panned out to this point. So one thing that I was wondering for the Mets is like, if he's not your shortstop of the future, how are you going to build his value to the point where you can trade him for something meaningful? And so this also solved that issue in the Lindor trade was that they were able to you know, trade Rosario for something meaningful. Grand, you give up Andres Jimenez. Obviously, you would have liked to keep him, but he was a popular ask, you know, from from teams, you know, for the Mets and in trades. And I just think um, this was the way to get it done. But I, you know, I don't really, I don't super disagree with people who might have said that um, that you know, I you know, there's shortstops on the market next year. Why why wouldn't you do it then? On the other hand, I think this is a great move, especially because now, you know, they can add George Springer, but they, you know, they don't have to, they can fill in, in other ways. Whereas had they have not gotten Lindor, there definitely would have been a lot more pressure to, to add a Springer type. The trade needed to be made, like I said, especially the way it worked out and landed on their lap. But right. here, but here's, but again, when I look at these trades, sometimes I look at them more in how it's going to affect other things more so than just necessarily where it's going to be on paper, right, in that, at the moment. So sure. I looked a little deeper into this. Lindor's value as a shortstop or his separation as a shortstop to other guys would probably be the fact that he gets into the 30s in terms of home runs. Now, if you look at his numbers, his ballpark where he was at, progressive field, ranked third and fifth. They were in the top five, two out of the last four of the years, with where most home runs are hit. Conversely, where he's coming to play now, City Field, has in 17 ranked 25th. In 18, ranked last, and in 19, ranked 26th. I'm not even going to look at last year because it was such a crazy year. But he's coming here. You can't expect a 30 home run guy now. So his production or his the the gap that he normally has, the stat that he normally separates him from other guys, is really almost gonna bring him back to the pack statistically. That's where I have the problem. And that's why I say that he needs to have if he's ever gonna have one great year in New York. Let's say they sign him, but he has the one great year. For the Mets' sake, it has to be this year because he can't come here, hit 22 home runs, and then expect the Mets to give him 250 when there's going to be so many other shortstop. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. and that, I mean, I, I do get that, but, I mean, he's still, ballpark aside, I mean, he's still got the power where he's a shortstop who can hit. I mean, you can bat him leadoff, but you can also hit him third. He utilizes power, and that that's pretty rare um, in the game. Obviously, Story's got that. Baez has a good bat, but I, I don't, I don't think any one of those guys that I see, even Seager. I mean, God, even with the the hot stick he swung, you know, in, in October, like always I, hurt. I don't see, I uh, yeah, ex and I yeah, exactly, and I don't, I don't see where those guys would excel over Lindor. I, I see, I see the point you're you're trying to make, though. I just think. I mean, the trade, you know, like you said, needed to be made. Um, but, yeah, it's going to be – that's why the Mets are in a tough position, right? Because with a – Francisco Lindor is, is a bona fide superstar, but it, it is a little bit of a different situation than the Mookie Betts thing to me. 
just because, I mean, Mookie Betts is, is kind of like a, almost like a generational player. I mean, I, I mean, on both sides. And then the Dodgers giving him that contract before he even played a game for them. Okay, great. And now the, you know, the Mets are going to have to make the same decision. And you're, you know, Francisco Lindor has done nothing over his career to say that, you know, to, to say that he won't live up to that contract he gets. But at its base, it is still a risk because he has said that he never negotiates, you know, during a season. So if you want to get an extension done, it's going to be before he's ever played a game for the Mets. So, I mean, there is, I, there is risk there. What about the Mets lineup going forward? Are they, where are they going to, what do you think they're going to hit Lindor? You think they're going to put him in the leadoff spot? I mean, he's a career, you know, three, I think three out of the last four years, he's been under 337, if I'm not mistaken, in on base percentage. So it's not like, and I think a lot of that is because he's not a very good right handed hitter. For a guy who's a switch hitter, he really struggles from the other side of the plate. Where are they going to bat him? Are they going to bat him leadoff? No, I would say, um, I mean, if I had to write the lineup card today, I would say third because, I mean, assuming with the piece the Mets have today, not including, you know, any free acquisition they might make, um, I mean, I think Nimmo is better suited to the leadoff spot, high OBP guy, you know, high, high walks guy, um, like that, always work count, I think is better suited for the leadoff spot. And then even, you know, hitting McNeil second, if you can get a guy like that who can just flat out hit, and then use Lindor, you know, some of that power third, um, and then, you know, Alonzo clean up and, and follow, or Conforto, whatever you want to do, kind of follow it back from there. But I really do see third because I just think that the Mets have, I mean, gosh, Lindor gives them three, you know, at least three players who can bat lead off. But I think I think Nimmo is better suited for it. And I think it's it's two of them to, to get the, Nimmo and McNeil up before Lindor. I mean, I think he's, with his power and then the way he can kind of hit gap to gap, I think he's such a good asset there at that then three hole. How concerned are the Mets with Alonzo after last year's again, I try to be I try to look at last year w- with some open with an open mind, right? But yeah. the strikeouts are a let me tell you something. If it wasn't for Gary Sanchez in this town, Pete Alonzo might might have been the next guy that you know he would have taken a lot of a lot of hits. How, where are the Mets on Pete Alonso right now? Right, I think I, you know, I, I kind of tend to. I think what they've said publicly is kind of what they actually do believe in the sense that okay, you know, it was a little bit of a down year, um, but but that you know it should it it should regress to to normal. Now that. That goes two ways, right? Regress to the mean goes, maybe he doesn't ever hit 53 home runs again like he did his rookie season. But maybe he doesn't ever hit, you know, as poor of an, an average in spurts as he did last season. Now, this is a guy, I mean, he, I mean he's a power hitter. He he can hit, you know, I, I do believe that he's in the developmental stage where he can improve and he can hit for more average. But that's really never the player he was built, built to be, right? I mean, like, that's he, he is a power hitter at the corners now. We're... They obviously, and he knows this, but they obviously know he needs to improve defensively, especially because last season we saw Dom Smith kind of give him a little more opportunity, get hot at the plate. And Dom Smith has always been known as, I mean, it's no secret that he is better defensively, you know, right now at first base than Pete Alonso is until we're shown otherwise. But that that is going to put a lot of pressure on, on Pete to improve defensively there. But I do think the Mets are – you know, waiting it out. He's still in that developmental stage. He's still young. Uh, he did make a big defensive leap from the minors to even his rookie season in the majors. So it's like, you know, that who knows what could happen, but it, it is no secret that, you know, throughout his life, his defense is not, you know, has not been his strong suit, but it's going to need to be better. And the funny thing is that even though, again, we, we're sitting here talking about his struggles, I mean, he, what do you have about 16 and 40 last year? I mean, a short season, 16 and he was in the high thirties. He still had 16 home runs, right? He was, he would have hit over 30, you know, in in a full season, he would have been fine. It's just that I think you get caught up in between two different fragments of people who people who value 
the on-base percentage, putting the ball in play, DJ LeMahieu type, and the people who don't care about it, and, and then with the strikeouts, right? So you there's people on both sides. You know, some people say, oh, who cares if he strikes out 160 times? I mean, Aaron Judge strikes out a boatload. You know what I'm saying? Nobody cares about what he does, but it, I think it's almost selective. Right, right. And that's, that's kind of the interesting part about it is that, you know, you could say, on one hand, on pace for 43 home runs. I mean, that's still that's still a great season. You know, something like that. 40, I think 43 is what he's on pace for. Uh, trying to do the math in my head. But, yeah, you could, you could say that. I think the more concerning part for the Mets is just that they – they saw him regret, you know, regress at points in a way like chasing pitches, not being so focused on the strike zone, um, letting one at bat, you know, lead into the one bat at bat, lead into another, things like that. That okay, it happens to young players, but he was so good at not, you know, obviously he was, he's always he's young, but he was so good in his rookie season at really not at trying to get pitchers in his zone and not going for pitches he shouldn't be should be going for and I think that's where he took a bit of a step back um, last year so yeah you could get two types of schools of, of thought there but I just think I mean you've got to be hitting 40 plus home runs if you're going to be you know striking out that much or maybe he maybe he will but it's just that he's got the talent to do so I think he will be better uh, the people you know writing him off or saying that the Mets should just go with Dom now are, are crazy I mean Dom is great but I mean I just mean the people riding Pete off are crazy. Um, look, he's still a young guy. It was a 60-game season and a weird year where everything was disrupted around spring training. And, yes, that happened for everybody. But, you know, you saw guys underperform and you saw other guys overperform to what they should have been. So, it, I mean, I think this year will tell us a lot about Alonzo and kind of the direction of, of his career. But it really is no secret that, I mean, power hitting corner infielders, man, are just like kind of kind of a commodity. So the the defense is going to need to improve, but also the discipline, you know, plate discipline and, and kind of all the things that that made him great that rookie season. You know, you mentioned defense. The outfield is something that I think with with, with Dom Smith being basically being out there, and I think the DH will help the Mets more than it will help other teams in the National League. I think they're more built like an AL team. Doms, right. they would be helped by it. Are what are they if they don't sign Springer, which I don't believe is going to happen because I think Springer's outpricing himself also. What are they going to do in the outfield because that outfield is not very good defensively. Um so you see so you said you don't think they're going to sign Springer. I don't think they're going to sign Springer and now there's okay. a lot of space to cover out there. Dom Smith is like I said is 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 a first baseman playing in the outfield. Nimmo again, I think he's a left fielder. Um, what are they going to do out there? All right, so I would say in that scenario, I'll take your scenario. If they don't sign Springer, Sandy Alderson has said, "Look, I mean, the previous regime wanted to, you know got Dom Smith out there just you know to get that bat in the lineup to get him in the lineup." Sandy Alderson has said you know, plainly, it's not ideal, you know, playing Dom and, and left. And that, you know, that's not a surprise. I mean, he's not great out there. Neither should he expect, you know, be expected to be. Correct. That's not his That's not his position. Now, things get a little hairy if the universal DH doesn't return. I still think there, there's no way we don't have, you know, the teams can use it. I think, and let's just say it returns. Um, out there, if they don't sign Springer, Brandon Nimmo has said that he could play center field. He wants to play there and thinks he can improve there. You know, he's, he's got to improve by, by a lot, but certainly not as bad as some people make him out to be. But he is, I think he would be better suited for left field. So I think what the Mets would look to do in that situation is I think if you don't sign Springer, then you put Nimmo in left. If you've got the DH, Don's there and can spell, you know, play some first, depending on, you know, and Pete can play the, depending on how that's working, you can, kind of stick him to his more natural position. In center field, um, one option that really intrigues me is Jackie Bradley Jr. And I think, um, look, this is a guy that he's not going to have the type of bat that a lot of his teammates will in, in that lineup. But if you're looking for better outfield defense, I think you can sacrifice a little bit of that hitting because you do have the Lindors and the Alonzos no. and 
Dom Smith, and and I think that would be a good option for a them, thousand especially percent. if they, yeah, especially if they don't want to stay, you know, if they want to stay. And look, it, it allows them if they were not to sign Springer and they did that, it allows them a good center fielder that improves their outfield defense. And by not signing Springer, uh, there's there's more room to for a bigger Conforto extension or contract, you know, to retain him in free agency after next year. Plus without signing Springer, if they do want to stay into the luxury tax threshold, you know, they're more free to go after a better reliever, like a Brad Hand versus, you know, maybe a mid-tier reliever, and they can add another starter. No, and, and realistically, the Mets issue last year, let's say, again, if you want to take, let's talk about last year, even though it was a condensed season, they led the league in hitting average-wise. Their right. problem was they couldn't score runs in spots. Right. Right. So if they have to sacrifice something, you know what I'm saying? It's not going to be the end of the world. But you brought up the bullpen to wrap up the Mets here. You brought up the bullpen. They, I think this year, more than any other year in baseball, teams are going to have to go to six starters, maybe seven, because these guys were not stretched out last year. Right. On top of that, I think the bullpen is going to be more of a, of a necessity. And I don't necessarily mean the back end. I'm talking about your middle of the road guys that can give you three, four innings. By what, eating up innings. And a thousand percent. What are the Mets going to do to help out the pitching? So I think, honestly, I think they... It's the first good sign of this new regime and free agency was was signing Trevor May because the bullpen look was not really an issue last year. It was a very big issue in 2019, but not so much last year. You had guys like Justin Wilson had a good year. Edward Diaz, even though he had I think four blown saves, had a great year. Otherwise, you know, if you look at his peripherals, but the thing um, with Edwin so, Diaz, the, the, then I don't mean to cut you off, Justin, but the thing with the thing with Edwin Diaz is the high leverage save that he he, he you know it's those. It's that game you need to win that he doesn't shut down. Right, and that's that's kind of the thing that'll that'll be interesting to see if you know they can sign a, a Brad Hand type to to get an, another option in there. But in terms of what you're talking about, helping out the pitching, I think the Mets are uniquely suited because if they do add a Brad Hand type like that as as kind of another back end option, then right that frees up a you know a Robert Gesellman who they tried to stretch out last year for the rotation because they needed him. That frees him up to, he's a guy who started before, you know, before he was in the bullpen in his career um, to, to eat up innings. Jerry's Familia, I mean, large contract, uh, not a good contract, but on the last year of it, uh, maybe he can eat up a couple innings here and there. I'm also not, you know, with, with them having more back-end options in terms of Diaz, let's say they sign like a Brad Hand, you know, they still got Miguel Castro. Um you know, Dallin Batances. You might see him after a rough year pitching in, in some of those middle innings. And um, and also they've got Brad Brock, who had a rough end to, to 2020. But, I mean, you know, the guy got COVID, weird season. But he was very good for them after signing there in, in 2019, the middle of that season. So, um, I think – I mean, I, I really do think that the bullpen can be a strength for this team, as, as funny as it sounds, because it's almost like – it's almost like you can hardly call – teams is bullpen a strength right because they're so volatile in today's game and hitters are so good and you and relievers can be so unpredictable but I, I really do think that they could have a very good bullpen because you know especially they added Trevor May um, so I think they've got a lot of they've got a lot of good options back there and the important part too is now I think they're they have some better organizational depth with a couple of those options they've added that um that it shouldn't be as thin as it was last year pitching-wise and, and helping the, the starting rotation. Justin, man, I appreciate your time. Thank you for uh, for coming on and, and breaking down the Mets, man. You uh, you know your stuff, and I appreciate you giving me you know some time here to talk about the Mets. Of course, yeah. Thanks so much for having me on. Always happy to do it. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening to The Sergio Rodriguez Show. And remember that The Sergio Rodriguez Show is a show unlike any other.